to be the first one uh, here talking to you guys today. Uh, I think that it's uh, pretty appropriate to start off with a historical talk. Um, and uh, the title, For Whom Are We Performing, sort of suggests uh, the, um, uh, the way we've been positioning microdosing as a performance enhancing drug. And I'm going to get into how it was that uh, this positioning of microdosing has been uh, historically constructed and what its implications are. And uh, I'm actually pretty nervous for this talk because I normally uh, present on similar work. This is just my area of scholarship um, at uh, psychology conferences or history conferences where I show up as an advocate of psychedelics. Uh, and over here, we're, I'm assuming at least all advocates of psychedelics. So I'm taking a bit of a, a critical stance uh, because we all share the baseline of uh, thinking that you know uh, it's only right for them to be legal, it's only right for them to be uh, researched in uh, medical context and uh, freedom and sovereignty of consciousness and all this stuff. So, uh, but I do want to push at that a little bit. So. Let's start pushing. Uh, uh, so why look at the history of microdosing? First of all, it's objectively cool. We're talking <laughs> about like the Greek mythology of uh, contemporary Western civilization. You have uh, super geniuses, uh, eccentric celebrities, espionage. Um, it's, it's just fun. Uh, but more importantly, uh, history tells us how it is that we've arrived to... So uh, all the things we think about microdosing uh, are kind of maybe historically dislocated, but we've come to think of them uh, of it in a certain way due to historical circumstances. And uh, when we see how it is that we arrived at thinking about it in this way, we start seeing all of the kind of... Um, assumptions and anachronisms that are packaged into it uh, that might not be relevant to us anymore, uh, might not fit the way we think about uh, justice in the contemporary world. So things we can start shedding and being more reflexive about uh, our practices. Um, so with that being said, there's going to be two parts to my presentation. I'm going to get into the history of psychedelics, of, of uh, microdosing specifically. Um, and then I'm going to uh, uh, present a bit of a critical perspective on it. Um, and by show of hands, have people kind of looked into the history of psychedelics and uh, microdosing specifically, read some books on it and stuff, yeah? Cool, okay, so um, as you know, and um, it, it's, a, it's a pretty, uh, it's still a pretty esoteric area of scholarship despite it uh, gaining uh, uh, mainstream acceptance. Uh, so uh, on one hand, we're all kind of going to be drawing from a similar pool of resources because there hasn't been that much research on it. On the other, I'm going to try and synthesize some sources you might have not necessarily thought of putting together. Um, so can everyone hear me good with this thing? Nice. Before getting into the actual history of uh, what microdosing is. I want to break down what it is we think it is. Um, because there, isn't, there wasn't a unified practice of microdosing until very, very recently. Um, but uh, how we've arrived to think about microdosing as um, a way of enhancing your cognition, of being more creative, of having more stamina at work, all of that stuff has its roots in almost the very beginning of uh, Western psychedelic psychiatry. Um, and uh, coming about sort of in different episodes throughout the 50s, 60s, 70s. Um, but now we have all of that stuff packaged into a protocol uh, that was um, uh, made popular by uh, Jim Fadiman, by um, uh, Third Wave. Uh, organization, and that's uh, the kind of idea that you take a subperceptual dose, something around 10 micrograms of acid or uh, 0.2 grams of uh, mushrooms, 
Uh, you use it somewhat regularly, so every third day for 10 weeks. Uh, you uh, become a citizen scientist, you take notes on your experience, uh, you have this sort of analytic introspective approach to it, and uh, you uh, follow your normal routine. So how is it that this protocol, which we're familiar with, came together with um, these expectations of what the protocol does? Uh, so uh, we begin in the late 1950s, but really, so LSD was uh, first synthesized in a lab uh, in the late 1930s, but it was in the late 1940s that it was synthesized again and um, actually uh, sent out to uh, psychiatrists uh, for the purpose of researching its potential uses. Uh, and um, early on, uh, psychiatrists tapped into the idea actually not just psychiatrists, but psychologists, that uh, you can use small doses of the drug, so still uh, you register them in your perception. Uh, they're not sub-perceptual, but they're much smaller than what we would think of as a recreational or standard dose. Um, that these are actually really effective doses for um, having people feel comfortable in the therapeutic situation, um, be able to tap into processes of uh, transference easily, uh, re-experience traumas really viscerally, but still be there, able to communicate with their therapist. Um, so uh, there was this hypothesis that uh, uh, LSD in small doses uh, would enhance your participation more than large doses would. Large doses actually interfere where, uh, while they might uh, have uh, incredible phenomenological significance, uh, you might not actually uh, be able to use that significance, those mystical experiences, in uh, psychologically productive ways because they come at you, uh, you leave them, you're amazed, but you don't necessarily integrate them. And this was at odds with the psychoanalytic model, which was that you very slowly, very gradually, uh, purge your traumas, expose your unconscious, come to confront it, come to understand it, uh, abreact, which is to say, uh, re-experience the emotions of those traumas and memories, and that, that was the therapeutic process. Um, so that, that was the use of small doses in a clinical context. Um, how is it that it became associated with um, uh, performance enhancing and creativity enhancing in the actual workplace. So in the early 1960s, um, a uh, faction of engineers uh, that hung out with a clinical group uh, in uh, Northern California, uh, a group called the Sequoia Seminar, uh, affiliated with uh, uh, Stanford University, um, began to research LSD in their own way. They were pretty into the full dose experience. Um, and uh, so this is Myron Stolaroff and Willis Harmon. They, start, they started a, an organization called the International Foundation of Advanced Study. And uh, they would charge uh, company scientists and uh, uh, scholars whose scholarship pertained to industry, so engineers, architects, mathematicians, something like $500 to come in and have a session and uh, experience, have a sort of peak experience and uh, come to understand uh, the full breadth of power and knowledge they have access to and creativity. And uh, in the mid-60s, they hooked up with uh, um, some psychologists, including Jim Fadiman, uh, to research uh, the um, ability, uh, like, to actually uh, get some definitive uh, empirical research on how it is that uh, LSD might enhance creativity. Um, so they enlisted uh, uh, scientists, engineers, uh, mathematicians uh, to come in, take LSD, um, take a moderate but not entirely full dose, and um, think about uh, an occupational problem. And in uh, the process of doing this, 
uh, they discovered uh, a pretty profound uh, <coughs> success rate in terms of, uh, first of all, uh, their quote unquote objective measures, the actual uh, quantitative assessments. Um, they did a pre post test uh, where uh, they had people uh, fill out uh, surveys about their. Um, uh, uh, one second, how did I write this down? Where was that? So, uh, stuff about uh, their, oh my God. Okay, uh, pattern recognition, visual discrimination, uh, visual distraction. So these were cognitive assessments, and they found that um, under the influence of LSD, uh, people's performance on these tasks, these tasks uh, were elevated. Uh, but aside from that, for actual uh, uh, self-report qualitative information, uh, they found that uh, people uh, thought more broadly about their problems. Uh, they were able to concentrate for longer periods of time. They were able to visualize and uh, fantasize their problems through to extents that they weren't uh, before. Uh, they were able to experience empathy. Um, access their unconscious, not necessarily in the sense of accessing uh, uh, infant memories and stuff like that, but of knowledge. They, they were able to recruit knowledge that they never would have associated with their problem because it was something that they implicitly learned and forgot. Um, so, uh, and they followed up with their participants and found uh, that many of them um, came out of the study having established uh, uh, certain initiatives at work, uh, created patents, uh, designed buildings, uh, all from insights that they had during the study. So uh, we see there's starting to be a connection between um, uh, the act of taking LSD and um, the ability to uh, be more creative, to be more productive, all of this stuff. Um, and there was another connection to industry at this time. Um, Al Hubbard, uh, who was a, an eccentric um, people connector, really, who had an incredible fortune uh, accessible to him, uh, was a major player in the early dissemination of LSD uh, to scientists. And he took a real interest in the Menlo Park group uh, because he himself was involved with industry. He believed that the quickest way to influence society was by uh, giving LSD to people with money and influence, uh, and that uh, by them taking on a new religious perspective, um, their, uh, their perspective would trickle down through changes in their own priorities. Um, and. Uh, so that's, that's kind of how this type of research was funded. And uh, you know, when you have the vice president of Hewlett Packard, uh, who was one of the people in the study, coming in and taking LSD and raving about it uh, for decades after, uh, that's expected to have some sort of trickle down effect, even if it's not in the sense that uh, ideas actually become better. Uh, it's the idea that. Uh, this is a person who wields enough power to influence the culture in their workplace. Uh, Hewlett Packard is a, a major uh, site of industry in Silicon Valley and uh, could potentially influence uh, other uh, cultures around it. Uh, so we see the idea of uh, the performance enhancing qualities of microdosing being seated specifically in Silicon Valley. Uh, and Huffington Post and Rolling Stone love to beat us over the head with that fact today. Um, one more point, uh, John C. Lilly, uh, who was a very, uh, he was a polymath, he uh, had his fingers in a lot of pies, but what he was trained in was um, psychoanalysis, medicine, and uh, neuropsychology, and uh, he, uh, he became, he's currently probably remembered best for research he did in the 1950s and 60s where uh, 
he, first of all, he invented the um, sensory deprivation tank. Um, he also gave LSD to dolphins and took LSD himself and tried to establish um, forms of interspecies communication in these states. So incredibly eccentric uh, and incredibly influential. And uh, so he uh, wrote a book, he wrote many books uh, that were autobiographical. One of them was called The Center of the Cyclone. In it, he recounts going to Chile to sit with a man named Oscar Ichazo, a Bolivian philosopher who founded a human potential movement uh, group called the Arica School. And uh, Oscar described to Lily different levels of the uncon of uh, consciousness, uh, which uh, Lily framed in terms of Satori. Uh, satori is a Japanese Buddhist term meaning awakening. It's kind of uh, the, an expression uh, of the concept of enlightenment. And uh, Lily had several uh, uh, planes of Satori that you could access. And one of them he called the professional Satori. It was only slightly above ordinary consciousness. And it's the level at which people felt creative, motivated, immersed in their tasks, uh, uh, immersed specifically in tasks in which they felt competent. And in his words, it's the uh, level uh, at which uh, we lose ourselves in practice. It's the enjoyment of the automatic nature of what one is doing, plus the loss of sense of self. And this is reminiscent of the category of experience that Heidegger calls uh, the ready at hand, uh, which is to say that uh, you are so involved in an experience that you're not thinking, uh, this is a podium, this is a computer, this is a cup of coffee. Everything is in terms of action, and it's entirely embodied, and you're just in it. And uh, uh, he said the state can be achieved in any profession, from professional sports to science to politics, and it's actually the ideal state in which one could work. So that's sort of how uh, we came to think of uh, psychedelics as um, substances uh, that enhance our performance. Um, and while that's the history of that stuff, all that stuff comes up really implicitly in modern texts about psychedelics. So it's kind of been uh, cut off from their uh, historical context. Uh, but in uh, these texts, we start to see uh, more uh, standard protocols emerging. So uh, the, the research on the usefulness of psychedelics came to a pretty abrupt end <coughs> in the late 60s. Uh, and uh, a, a small group of psychiatrists continued to work with LSD in Europe, but uh, their, their actual research output was pretty negligible. Uh, Due to the uh, illegality and the lack of research, uh, a lot of these uh, uh, things aren't necessarily as rig rigorously sourced as we might expect from scholarly material. So it's a confluence of uh, self-reports uh, and uh, through people reporting on their own practices with microdosing, we've come to develop expectations for how to use it. Um, so. Uh, that book over there, the one by Jenny Zoroff, it really just touches on this thing I'm about to talk about. He has an article that goes more in depth about it. Um, he's a journalist and he's focused on uh, coverage of extreme sports. And he's noted that uh, in the world of extreme sports, uh, there's been a culture of microdosing for decades. He traces the history of how this came to be. Hippies and deadheads and back to the land uh, uh, type of folks. Uh, moved to remote places and uh, brought LSD with them. And a lot of these remote places were places where uh, uh, the way you kind of like mm, uh, come to meet the land you're in is by surfing, uh, by skiing. And uh, LSD was brought into these contexts. Um, he uses the term psycholytic, uh, which was that term from the 1950s that uh, referred to the use of small doses in psychotherapy. And uh, this is a sort of forgotten term, but it was the uh, main uh, currency in which people uh, microdosed uh, in this context before the term microdosing proliferated. Uh, so you would take LSD, uh, probably more than subperceptual doses, but not a full on dose, just to get in the zone. And uh, athletes uh, found that it improved their cognitive functioning, physical stamina. And uh, he, he uh, claims that this culture still very much is alive 
in the practice of extreme sports. Has anybody read this book, uh, A Really Good Day? Yeah, so Ayala Waldman, she's a lawyer and a lecturer and a writer, and she talks about how um, she, uh, she has a, she's been diagnosed with bipolar disorder, and um, the, uh, just the laundry list of treatments that she went through that were uh, ineffective comprised a prominent part of this book, and she describes uh, coming to LSD, uh, microdosing, uh, having to do it illegally, despite being a very legally straight person. And uh, this was a, uh, it's not that microdosing all of a sudden made her happier like she expected from uh, the way that other treatments led her to believe the results of uh, treatment would be. It's that all of a sudden uh, she was uh, able to perceive her emotions in, um, in their role in the present moment, to see them as rich, significant, uh, making sense, and by having more access to presence, uh, she was able to achieve a lot of the things that other treatments never opened up for her, so closeness to her family, uh, a felt sense of meaning, and uh, these, uh, 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 she, she achieved this by following uh, Kahneman's protocol. Um, and uh, has anybody read this book, specifically the chapter that talks about uh, microdosing? So he doesn't actually call it necessarily just microdosing. You get a sense that the term hasn't necessarily congealed yet. He also refers to it as self-perceptual dosing, or like a tenor, as in 10 micrograms. And um, so in this book, uh, he describes uh, the only possible way he could have uh, conceived to be able to research this, uh, which is by self-report. So he issued interested people a protocol um, that uh, had them uh, do their um, uh, microdoses uh, every third day for 10 weeks and uh, report back to him. Uh, and uh, people reported getting work done easier, <coughs> being more fun to be around, acing exams, feeling more creative, connecting better with people, basically better across the board. And he even knows that he didn't really receive any report of anybody having uh, anything close to a bad time. Um, the last book I have there, A Quick Guide uh, to Microdosing Psychedelics. I'm less interested in the book itself as I am in the organization that publishes it, which is called Third Wave. People heard of Third Wave? Yeah. So um, they're referring to the notion that there's a third wave in psychedelic culture, the first wave being indigenous use, which is, uh, I, I contest thinking about that as a kind of first wave, that it's just categorically different. Um, the second wave being uh, the um, golden age of psychedelic psychiatry in the 1950s. And uh, so the third wave is a microdosing advocacy foundation that makes many of the implications from these other books explicit. It asserts a need to distinguish between recreational and nootropic uses of psychedelics. It denounces the association between psychedelics and dropping out, and instead pledges to establish psychedelics as, quote, practical measure tools that could be integrated into mainstream culture. And uh, the founder, Paul Austin, himself an entrepreneur, stated that microdosing could give humans the creative edge that will keep them competitive in a market that is tending towards increased automation. Uh, the website has an instructional infographic on microdosing that retains many of the features of Fadiman's protocol, the size of the dose, the frequency of use, the goal of uh, the use, the act of self-reporting. And uh, I actually probably should have gotten a slide of it up here but I can send these around if people are interested after. Uh, and between these recent publications, we're seeing a standardization of microdosing, both in its goals and in its protocol. So that's how it is that we've arrived at that. And uh, there was always something that kind of rubbed me wrong about microdosing, just because maybe like the community of scholarship I inhabit, but this tweet got me thinking about it a lot more explicitly. So, drugs in the 60s, this will free your mind. Drugs now. By doing small amounts of LSD, I maximize productivity, generating capital for <laughs> um, And uh, so, uh, the way that uh, the popular media talks about a microdosing, and the way I see it coming up on social media, uh, very much has always struck me as this. When I was looking into the history 
I started seeing how it's actually a lot more sensitive, but the larger cultural impression is that people take acid at work and uh, not enough to make them uh, kind of start uh, questioning the social structures that they inhabit, but enough to make them feel zingy and motivated and ready to get up and go. And um, so uh, I started <coughs> digging around uh, ways to start framing my critique. And this is sort of my first expression of it, so I still see holes in it. And at the end, I have a couple of discussion questions I'd love to bring up for you and uh, see uh, your takes on it, whether you agree, whether you have uh, some additional areas that I can look at. Um, but I'll just uh, get into these uh, three books a little bit over here. Um, so the first one, Drugs for Life by Joseph Dewitt, he's a medical anthropologist. Uh, he's written about the pharmaceutical industry's effort to inoculate populations with market research driven di uh, discourses designed to influence the way that people discuss their health. Using information kits and television ads, pharmaceutical companies gave people opportunities to try on tentative classifications such as might be depressed or at risk for heart disease. And these new discourses became sedimented as people can, uh, confessed their conditions to their doctors, creating an opening for pharmaceutical companies uh, to uh, market daily dose drugs under the pretext of risk management. <coughs> So uh, this is very different from our prior historical orientation to drugs, uh, where they were seen as uh, a, a cures for acute conditions rather than forms of management for chronic ones. Uh, and the current standard microdosing protocol recommends that people use LSD once every three days for 10 weeks, or some sort of uh, frequent basis that abates the um, um, what's the word uh, tolerance of the drug while still lets you maintain frequent use. And uh, I suspect that this recommendation is largely passed as credible uh, because it's made within a culture that's grown comfortable with the consumption of daily dose pharmaceuticals. The act of taking a drug frequently for self-management has become essentially mundane. It's not something we necessarily think about as taking a drug anymore in uh, the sense that it might have been thought of 50 years prior uh, or in a recreational context. So that next book, Saving Normal, it's written by Alan Francis. Uh, he uh, is a psychiatrist. He chaired uh, the task force that published uh, the fourth edition of the Diagnostic Statistical Manual, which is the kind of uh, the manual for uh, diagnosing uh, psychiatric conditions that's used in North America. And so he reiterates Dumit's concerns with early screening and preventive pharmaceuticals. He also implicates the medical industrial complex, which is to say pharmaceuticals, the insurance industry, um, uh, the lab, uh, the, the manufacturing of lab and medical materials. Uh, he implicates them in the shaping of public discourses in ways that are overly comfortable with daily doses and risk management. He calls it disease mongering. And he adds another force that contributes to this, uh, diagnostic inflation. So he contends that with mass screening, Diagnostic criteria have become increasingly inclusive. He's especially concerned with the implications this has for psychiatric diagnoses, which have been shown to be fluid over the course of history. With psychiatric conditions, diagnostic inflation has been closely tied to fads, which is to say, as a condition becomes socially salient, uh, Francis notices a rise in self-identification that necessarily captures a whole host of people who would not otherwise uh, be considered to have a disorder. So that's where there's a slippage of what normal means. So the result is increasing lenience with the diagnostic criteria, increased dispensation of drugs, such as those for ADHD or depression, uh, without rigorous evaluation in a psychiatric or psychological context, so in uh, uh, the context of a, a family doctor visit, and the spreading of the tacit notion that psychological abnormality is, out, is pervasive but correctable through consumerism. So targeting the worried well. And uh, this strikes me as relevant because uh, current reporting on microdosing uh, definitely uh, has the flavor of a fad, which is to say that uh, it's, uh, it, it, it is at risk for being taken up as a panacea and something that should, could be used for maybe a lot more than it should be used for. And, uh, this other book over here by Nicholas Rose, The Politics of Life Itself, uh, Biomedicine, Power, and Subjectivity in the 20th uh, 
uh, 21st century. Nicholas Rose, he's a British sociologist. Um, he uh, uh, organizes his uh, critiques of psychology and psychiatry around a uh, Foucauldian concept called technologies of the self. So this term is related to the social theory of a French historian named Michel Foucault. It's a simple idea that in our daily lives, we interact with devices that reflect to us an idea about who we are. With the medical survey, social media, church confessionals. So according to Nicholas Rose, psychiatric drugs have become a prominent vehicle for conveying to us that we are neurochemical selves. He repeats that which was articulated by Dumit and Francis. The most commonly sold drugs are those taken chronically, so blood pressure, cholesterol, psychiatric medication, and according to Rose, in this context, drugs do not contain any intention of cure, but of maintaining normalcy. They become one of the first things we turn to when we sense something is off about ourselves, or sense that we need to improve ourselves. I've been having uh, this happen to me a lot recently, actually, especially when I've had uh, difficult times concentrating on my work. My first thoughts are often, do I have ADHD? Have I never been diagnosed with ADHD? Do I need to get a prescription for Adderall? Uh, can microdosing help me in this context? It hasn't. Uh, and then I think about what that might mean, uh, which is that there's comfort in finding an explanation for my behavior that does not force me to confront boredom, disinterest, occupational and financial anxiety, and my attachment to my current material conditions. Rose would say that I was thinking in line with a culture that has not just come to see drugs as a first-line intervention, but that is a victim to more insidious consequence of that fact. That we have come to frame our interiority within neurochemistry, and are thus prone to express our dissatisfaction in neurochemical <coughs> terms. This means that I might be more likely to address my negative thoughts and feelings through neuromodulation, not just by drugs, but by eating chocolate or doing activities that the internet tells me increases my serotonin, than by considering how they might be, uh, my dissatisfactions might be related to societal dysfunctions. Um, so I think I'm just gonna speed along ahead here. I uh, go on to my next slide. I dumped a bunch of uh, critique on you guys might not have been entirely coherent just yet, but if there are actual scientists in the room, I wanted to have a slide of takeaways because I think that uh, these, uh, something more con concrete than just, just percolate on these ideas. So the first point, uh, what can we do as researchers? One is being aware of how microdosing as we know it is socially and historically constructed. The purpose of this is to understand what it is in our research we're carrying as a vestige of history and what it is we're actually doing intentionally. The second point, acquainting ourselves with, current, uh, with a critical literature on pharmaceuticals before designing our studies. And I think this is important because A, if you agree with it and acquaint yourself with this literature, then you'll carry it forward into your own work. B, if you read into it and don't agree with it, then that would be a really important thing to state in your work as well, and you're actually contributing to the discourse of uh, social critique around pharmaceuticals. Uh, third point, including in our research a discussion of where microdosing is situated within contemporary attitudes towards drugs and stating how we want our research to be used and received. And fourth, I really regret not being able to get into this more, it kind of, uh, was something that I expected to do, but all of a sudden found, oh, I said a bunch of stuff and didn't have that much time to delve into something which is really important. I actually super regret it. But designing studies that keep in mind the experiences of, pe of people outside of uh, the professional white collar class, so taking into account race, gender, and other important factors that intersect with economic class. The reason for that is the context in which microdosing has thrived which is the white collar context of Silicon Valley, um, is a really small subsection of our society. It also happens to be the subsection that has received the most amount of help from uh, our institutions, or institutions being the government, um, uh, uh, the uh, side disciplines, uh, the medical uh, disciplines, and uh, to just say it out there, it's, it's white men. And uh, there's uh, a whole bunch 
of work being done, of the majority of work being done, I would say, that is not being done by this uh, uh, subsection of people, um, work that is actually of the working class, and uh, we have uh, really very little to say uh, historically in studies that have been done about how microdosing can be relevant uh, to people in uh, those uh, intersections of society. Um, so uh, the question here is, by looking at microdosing as an assistant of the professional class, are we expending our scholarly resources helping out the most well-helped population in the history of Western civilization? Does microdosing have anything to offer those who experience professional challenges that actually make or break their economic security, their mental health, and their families? And uh, so I hope we have time. I wanted to end it on these discussion questions. Four minutes? All right. Well, these are just some questions. I'd be really happy to talk to you guys about them after. And if anybody wants to address any of these or anything else in my talk, let me have it. I don't see any hands. I'm super thorough. Hey. Um, you talked about discounting the first wave of psychedelic use in indigenous populations. Uh, oh. Or microdosing in indigenous populations. Is there a reason for that? Yeah, it's, not, it's absolutely not that I discount the use but that I disagree with framing out of it as a first wave. It strikes me as progressivist. Uh, indigenous cultures still use psychedelics, things we call psychedelics that they would call other things. And uh, that's actually something I also regret not having been able to talk about. Um, but uh, I don't think that it should historically be seen as contiguous with uh, psychedelic psychiatry and psychology. Yes. Has there, have there been studies on the effect of uh, microdosing on the general health of the body as opposed to the performance enhancing qualities? Right. There have been no studies on it. Um, in Fadiman's book, uh, the, the chapter uh, is essentially a series of uh, case studies that he presents. And uh, I I don't recall actually if anybody specifically talks about health. Do you, do you have a comment on this specifically? Yeah, no, not on this specifically, but I have an, an additional part of that question. I uh, I'll get to you in a second. I think okay. I have an answer to this. Question. Oh, you do? Yeah, oh, great, I'm, please. I'm Jim Fadiman's research partner. Oh, hey. Uh, hi. <laughs> um, and I'll be presenting data this afternoon, um, about some, some about general health. Okay, great. Yes. I think you'll probably answer my question. Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> Is that it? Uh, yes? Um, when you were posing the question about um, so in the context of critical thought considerations, why is it that we're helping white men, et cetera, professionals, that notion of help, um, can you talk a bit more about that in the context of this, the eco, the, the critical kind of uh, considerations that you're articulating about how we tend to, in a sense, drug ourselves. Right. It's a quick fix. So if professionals choose to flip a switch, a chemical switch, to join back into life as usual, then are they helping themselves? I mean, it's an interesting mix in language you've used. It's sort of like they've chosen a course of dumbing themselves down. Yeah. So I think um, if we're talking about it uh, in Foucauldian terms, technologies of the self always exist in a variety of ways. And this community has tapped into one. And uh, it might not actually be one that's accessible for other people to tap into. Um, so whether they're dumbing themselves down, I think that's a question of whether they've deliberately chosen to uh, uh, cultivate a self using LSD as a technology, or whether it's something that they've just been uh, acculturated into. And uh, in that sense, um, when, when you're able to make a deliberate choice about uh, the technologies around you that you'd like to uh, cultivate yourself through, uh, that's when I think um, you're not you're making a more reflexive, profound choice. Does that get out of your question a little bit? Yeah, yeah. I, I think you're sitting on this edge of the interplay between informed, conscious choice 
absolutely. And culture. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.